Pokemon is turning 25 this year. I I'm a big fan, if, if you couldn't tell. It's the series that really ignited my passion for games. Normally, I try to keep my videos focused on just one element in the game, but w whatever. It's a big ol' celebration in the Pokemon community right now, so I'm just gonna gush about my favorite game in the series, Pokemon Emerald. It's really the Game Boy Advanced Hoenn region as a whole, so Ruby Sapphire is usually rolled into the mix as well whenever I refer to Emerald. I could and probably have talked at my friends for hours about how much I love this game, easily in my top 5. I love the art style on this gen, it's probably my favorite sprite work in the series. Call me controversial, but I'm just not a fan of the art style in gens 4 and 5. Emerald is also probably the only game that I like all three starters in pretty equally. I've done playthroughs with each starter at least once. Double battles from VGC also originated in gen 3, and admittedly I didn't really get into VGC until recently, but you gotta pay respect to the game that introduced this format. And one last kind of general thing. I really like the music in this game. There's a lot of funny trumpet memes, but honestly, the music slaps. Anyways, we're a design analysis YouTubist, so let's jump into those game design deets. Also, shout out to Cerebi, Bulbapedia, and Keyblade999 over at GameFAQs for compiling troves of data. Made this whole process of research so much smoother. Alright, let's get into it. I love the movement in this game. Now, I know, this is a weird place to start, especially since there's nothing crazy innovative about moving in the cardinal directions, but just hear me out. We're starting here because it's what left the first big impression on me. So try to imagine being baby Isaac in the second grade experiencing the Hoenn region for the first time. Generally, movement is not the most important or discussed elements in Pokemon games, but I really like how running was introduced in this generation. Prior to this, the only thing we had was walking and a bike, which wasn't available until the town with the third gym. As an idiot dum dum kid, I would have been fine if they didn't include running. It wasn't something I thought I needed. So when I got my running shoes in Emerald, it was a wonderful surprise. You get your little tutorial and Birch says, Oh, you saved me from a rat and fought my child. Now go out and catch some Pokemon. And as you're heading out, your mom gives you the fresh Pumas. It's a perfect way to kick off an adventure. A literal strong running start. And subsequent games just don't capture that feeling as well. The running start is still fun, but it doesn't hit as hard. And to be fair, this in part is because I've already experienced the sensation. I'm sure for those who got the running shoes for the first time in Diamond Pearl, it was still a powerful feeling. However, I still think Emerald does running better than all of its successors. And that's because of the animation. Following the third generation, the visual fidelity goes up. We go from 240 by 160 to a whopping 256 by 192. And so the art style gets an update as well. And like I said up top, I don't like the DS Pokemon games. The semi 3D environments and the battle particle effects, none of it really did it for me. I just prefer that low res crunchy look. And the same goes for the run animation as well. While I definitely agree it looks cleaner in future games, there are more frames in the run cycle, it's clearly conveyed, and it's more natural, but the run cycle loses a lot of energy. There was a charm to the franticness of the third gen run. I, I don't know if this was a deliberate choice or a technical limitation, but the movements matched the excitement I felt as a kid starting out on a new adventure. By the way, I I'm going to be making a lot of comparisons to other games. It's kind of inevitable with a franchise this big, so if I'm making a critique on Gen 4, it's not because I hate it. I'm just making observations about things that I personally like and dislike in the series. Okay, time to gush more about the movement in this game. Oh, you thought it was time to move on to the next topic? Heck no. There is a lot I love about this game. With the introduction of running shoes, the bike's added speed doesn't stand out as much as it used to. If we copy pasted the bike from an older game, it's nothing more than maximum overdrive. Spoiler alert, that's kind of what they did after this game. However, in Gen 3, the mock bike is stupid fast. Almost pointlessly so, but because this game is so awesome, it provides context to the speed. By going zoom, you have access to new areas and and some overworld mini challenges. There's the cycling road time trial, which while it doesn't reward you with anything tangible, is still a really fun challenge that has a strong sense of accomplishment behind it. There's also the cracked floor obstacles in Sky Pillar, which leads you to Rayquaza. And in Emerald, they add the Mirage Tower to the desert so you can either grab the claw or root fossils. The Acrobike, on the other hand, has a fun little movement kit that allows you to access special areas. Personally, I don't think the places you can reach with the Acrobike are as memorable as the places available with the Mock Bike, but this bike has a mundane charm that's all its own. Accessing new areas is the basic overworld functionality of HM, so I like that the bikes effectively become HMs that ask just a little bit more of you input-wise. And sure, Gen 4 had the ramps and the slopes, but Gen 3 just did it better. The gear changing in Gen 4 really only exists to solve ramp puzzles, and most of these puzzles were just 
choose the fastest setting. And that just makes the slower speeds pointless, because why would you want to go slow on the thing that makes you go faster? And the only place that there's any real depth on this is Wayward Cave. It's a fun little area, but it's the only time in the game that we get any development on this mechanic. Wait, 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 you're just gonna hide the entrance to this place right here? No conveyance at all, and ooh, okay, I will get to these boulders in a minute. Whew, I, I've got a lot of anger towards Gen 4 for things like this, but to be fair, the bikes in Gens 5 and 6 add pretty much nothing beyond going a little faster, and Gen 6 has running, roller skates, and a bike, like, why? W whatever. I'll, I'll talk more about traveling across the land later. Let's actually start moving through the plot of this game a little bit first. So after receiving your running shoes and that one dude stops staring at his feet for a couple hours, you're on your way to Petalburg City. You meet Wally and he's fine? I don't dislike his character, but it feels a little weird that he teaches you how to catch Pokemon even though after this moment he's always in your shadow, but whatever. When you meet Wally, you also meet one of the best used characters in Pokemon, your dad. He is far from being an interesting character, but his placement in your journey is really satisfying. After you finish the Wally tutorial, your dad laughs, calls you a noob, and then refuses to battle you until you've collected enough badges. And in this, there's a nice little hero's journey that you get to experience meeting your father, getting stronger on your journey, and then returning to face him. And after beating him, you get Surf, which feels like a rite of passage as the rest of the world opens up to you. By comparison, Sword and Shield does this technique twice, but the character investment is even weaker, and it turns out worse for it. Your relationship with Kabu and Raihan is even more disconnected, but I digress, it's not flawlessly executed in Gen 3, but it's still a satisfying loop there. And while we're at it, I describe Maxi and Archie in the same way. If you hadn't seen it, I made a whole video talking about the villains in the Pokemon series. Check that out. Anyways, one of the points I make is that all of these villains from Gen 3 onward are structurally the same. They get the box art Pokemon to achieve their comically evil goal. Personally, I just like the way it was implemented in Gen 3 the best. And again, you might disagree with this. A lot of people love the plot of Diamond Pearl and Black White. If you like those villains more, more power to you. Shadow the Edgehog with his bull cut army and Geistus Harmonia Gropius? Whatever. Neither of them worked for me. All these goobers are just nonsensical Saturday morning cartoons with ridiculous schemes. Archie and Maxie are confident in their stupid cause, but they don't take themselves too seriously. And I like it that way. It's Pokemon. I don't need to hear the villain soliloquy about humanity. Serviceable, underdeveloped fun is how I describe like 90% of the characters in Pokemon. And that's perfectly fine with me. That being said, there is one character from Gen 3 that I genuinely enjoy. Steven. The first time you meet him, he's just some dude standing alone in a cave staring at rocks. He's revealed to be the champion in Ruby Sapphire, but in Emerald, he's still just some dude who likes looking at rocks. Admittedly, this makes the replacement champion Wallace even less compelling, but I like Steven as this vagrant soul, a mysterious dude who doesn't like battling despite how strong he is. He's also by far the most invested character in your journey to the top. And sure, it's a satisfying ending if he's the champion, but I just think it's sick that he's innocuously sitting even higher than the strongest person in Hoenn, waiting as a secret final boss. In addition to that, Emerald has you team up with him for a new fight in the Moss Deep Space Center. Team up battles aren't the most exciting, but this is the first one, so there was a novelty to it. Plus, he's actually useful, and the battle itself is nice and short. Like I said, most of the humans in this game are serviceable, but not compelling. The actual Pokemon, on the other hand, are wild fun and bring the world to life. So without further ado, let's talk about those Pokemon. Gen 3 has some really charming little beans, but I want to focus on the dumbest one, Rayquaza. Its inclusion in Emerald is so stupid. Another, another weird statement, I know, but hear me out. It's so stupid that it's hilariously fun, especially having played Ruby first. So let's go through this experience. When Kyogre and Groudon awaken and start wreaking havoc, you go to Cetopolis. And in the original Ruby Sapphire, this is where Steven would lead you to fight and capture Groudon or Kyogre. But in Emerald, you get Wallace asking you a multiple choice quiz that you literally can't fail in order to get you to Sky Pillar, which, you know, is this mysterious tower just hanging out in the middle of the ocean. And to be fair, they do drop some hints in the dialogue to guide you more naturally. Now, as dumb as this setup is, I, I don't actually hate it. Once you get to Sky Pillar, you climb up the tower, wake up Rayquaza, and fly back to Zetopolis for an epic cutscene. It's nothing groundbreaking, especially by today's standards, but this is Pokemon's first in-game cutscene, so to jump from this to this, fantastic. Chef's kiss. And if that's where it ended, it would be fine. I would think it's dumb, but I'd be satisfied with it. But instead, the game drives right into Clown Town, because after this cutscene, you can just go back to Sky Pillar and catch Urquaza, who's sitting at the low, low level of 70. 
Mind you, the rest of the game at this point is in the mid 40s, and the Elite Four's toughest Pokemon is 58. You can easily just sweep the main game. Just looking at this at face value, it's busted, and by all accounts, should ruin the game. But going from this hype cutscene to being able to add the lad to your team? I, I don't know, something about how my enthusiasm traveled with these events just felt right. And this feeling is even further cemented if you played Ruby Sapphire first. I already fought my way through these goons once before, so there's a catharsis in being able to return and just crush them with Rayquaza. Plus, Emerald has the Battle Frontier, which doesn't allow for legendaries, so if you really want to experience the full depth of challenge that this game has to offer, you still gotta put in the work. I'll talk a bit more about the Battle Frontier in just a sec, so let me just wrap up my thoughts about the Pokemon in this game. I, I don't actually have much to say in depth about them, I, I just think they're neat. I've heard a lot of people say that Gen 3 is where they started to not like Pokemon designs, but there's still a lot of personality in them. I also just like the colors they used in Gen 3. Gen 2 had a very light, pastel color palette, whereas Gen 4 was very bold in its colors. And I like that Gen 3 literally sits in the middle of these two. This is more about the world itself, but I really like that you can hear the Pokemon calling out while you're exploring the world. It's just a nice little detail that brings the world to life just a little bit with the Pokemon. Okay, on to Battle Frontier. Whenever anyone talks about Emerald, this is a major focal point, and it deserves all the praise it gets. I love that they teased the post game by replacing most of the contest centers with tents. The contests are a fun little side mission, but once you've done it once, playing through it again in the same town over isn't a fresh new experience. Just having the contest in Lily Cove is perfectly sufficient. Plus, between the tents and Scott, it builds to the battle frontier in a natural way. I like all of the different battle modes they offer. Now, full disclosure, I am poodoo at battles, especially as a kid, so I never made it very far in most of these. But nonetheless, I thought it was fantastic. And honestly, that wraps up my thoughts about Battle Frontier. The whole area is just a burrito. The Smeargle Cave is a fun little diverging path, and while I don't have too much to say on this little side venture, I have a lot to say about the rest of them, so let's jump into that. The big reason I like Gen 3 so much is because of how fun it is to explore. It's the Dark Souls of Pokemon, and I know, that's a meme, just hear me out. These games do a lot of things really well, but the thing it does the best is encourage players to explore the region. And I want to be very clear, encouraging players to explore and building a complex world to explore are two completely different goals. I'm not saying that the details and lore in the Hoenn region are on the same level as Lordran or Hyrule. Exploring the Hoenn region is basically, you make a little cinnamon bun on the left side and then you make kind of like the number two on the right side. It's incredibly simple compared to other games about exploration. And if this was all the game was, Emerald wouldn't be much to write home about, but the game does a fantastic job of pacing and teasing exploration. In more traditional narratives, this technique is known as Chekhov's Gun. If you're unfamiliar with the term, Chekhov's Gun is when something is introduced into the world because it will have a role later in the story. It's basically foreshadowing with tangible elements in the world. And this technique is especially effective in games because it's a great way to simultaneously teach the players how to play and move the game along at a reasonable pace. The Chekhov's gun is used in Emerald a lot from its HMs, and this video is a million bajillion hours long, so I'm only going to focus on a couple of them in detail, starting with Cut. Cut is not the most interesting ability, but it's typically the first HM you get, so its implementation is very important. It's a very basic key and door progression in games. However, with the right approach, this keys and door system can be incredibly rewarding. Uh, bah, 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 bah. No. I will talk about you another time. The most important thing Ruby Sapphire Emerald did was make cut optional. And I've triple checked this, the first HM you are required to use in this game is Rock Smash, which you get after the third gym. Cut exists purely as a means for the player to learn to explore. If the first HM was immediately required, like it is in just about every other Pokemon game, it would set the precedent that HMs are just keys used to unlock doors in order to progress. But by making the first HM we get optional while simultaneously introducing them in well-placed areas, it emboldens the player to go out and use these HMs for their own experiences rather than for the sake of progression requirements. I don't have to explore this side path here in Petalburg Woods, but the important thing is I can and I get rewarded with goodies aplenty for it. For comparison, Gen 6 also doesn't require cut to progress, but it lacks any sense of exploration because the rewards are immediately right behind the tree. It's more like using a key to unlock a chest, less like opening a door to a new adventure. In part, I think the camera angles they use inhibit the player from being able to explore the world. Maybe I'll do a video on that since it's been like three years since I last talked about cameras. Anyways, cut. Generations 1, 2, and 5 require you to use your first HM to progress your adventure. The optional uses of cut they offer require a decent amount of backtracking, or the rewards just don't feel as bountiful because it's key and chest again, it's not a new area to explore. 
w whatever. At least in comparison to the density of goodies you get with intended backtracking in Gen 3. Also, I guess you can get some shortcuts. It's fine, I don't have much to complain about this one. Gen 4, on the other hand, mixes it up by requiring Rock Smash to progress first, which is functionally the same thing. Gen 4 also offers an optional diversion path in Orberg Gate, and I would give it praise here, but if you do choose to take this path, you are almost immediately blocked by more obstacles. This is a frustrating tease because if you want to explore that cave, you need Rock Smash, the bike, Surf, and Strength. You don't get the full payoff of this experience until after the 6th gym, and this labyrinth of goodies is not in an area that you have a strong narrative incentive to revisit, especially since you unlock Fly well before this. The impression left on the player doesn't have much staying power since it isn't a wholly satisfying experience. So instead of encouraging the player to explore, you're taught to wait until you've unlocked all of your abilities because in the first instance of exploration, you're not good enough yet. Nothing sucks the joy out of exploration like being told to wait. Sorry, I rag on Diamond Pearl a lot, and I'll probably do it some more before this video ends. Uh, back on topic. Shortly after the game gets players comfortable with the idea of exploring, you do some things in Duford, and then whoa, look at that boat. It just emanates adventure. It's a tantalizing tease as you speed by on the SS Pico. By the way, just to complain about the 3D camera some more, you can't see the boat in Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire. It sucks, I literally forgot about it when I played through it. Anyways, back to the goat boat. While you can't explore half of the abandoned ship until after beating the 7th gym, unlike Gen 4, the game's narrative naturally directs you back to characters related to the ship after you unlock Dive, sprinkling in just enough world building to reignite that interest in that part of the map. Anyways, after driving by the abandoned ship, you encounter a healthy series of optional little side adventures that are constantly encouraging you to see what the world has to offer and tease you for what's to come. Just between landing in Slateport and Mauville, you have the Sea Shack Soda Challenge, the Battle Tent, the Trick House, which I'll get to in a bit, this little area off to the side with a few goodies, and a couple teases for things to come. And again, these are all optional things. There's plenty of narrative-driven focus that strings you along as well. And this is true of pretty much every route in the Hoenn region. As you continue to progress through the game, the world is constantly begging to be explored. There's a nice balance of teases, small side paths with goodies, NPC-driven activities, and large optional adventures. In more recent games, it's mostly just the side paths. The NPCs want to battle you or tell you some piece of world lore, but mostly just battle. Diamond Pearl offered some really cool NPC side quests that would allow you to travel through an optional area. Full disclosure, these are the bee's knees. Teaming up with rando NPCs for short little double battle campaigns was a really cool way to mix up gameplay and uh oh, that's the time to complain about Gen 4 alarm. I'm sorry, I think this part of Diamond Pearl is really cool, but it's not as fun as Gen 3 and rules are rules. It's a little bit of a bummer that they relies heavily on the narrative side. Making a new friend, plundering an island together, and then saying goodbye is a satisfying loop. I just don't like how produced it is. Which might sound kind of weird, I know. I've talked in past videos about how I want to see more NPCs that fill the world in a way that makes the world lively. But just th the way they did this one, I, I, I don't like it. And this is mostly directed at Riley. You have to board a boat to get to him, which doesn't feel nearly as organic as just running into him. Though to be fair, it's done more naturally with the other stat trainers. By the way, I completely forgot about these two. Anyways, back to Riley. While making your way through the island, you have to fight the Galactic Grunts. And putting the main antagonist group here is weird because it makes it feel like this is a required section and it's not optional. But whatever, the last little bit of complaint I have before getting back to my favorite game is I just don't like how long it lasts. Most other iterations of tag battles are short and sweet. Having only half the control for that long is kind of tiring. I, I like my agency in these games. Whatever, I'm bitter and sour. If you find joy in these, I'm happy for you. Speaking in a broader sense, more recent NPCs try to connect you to the lore you're in, how Pokemon and people are living in harmony, or the secrets of the legendary Pokemon. And while that's all well and good, it doesn't necessarily tie you to the world itself. The characters in the game might feel alive, but you're more of an outsider because a lot of this stuff happens regardless of if you're there or not. The Skidoo farm in XY, for example, it's adorable as heck. It's a charming bit of world building, and I love that you can just hop on a small lad and run around for a bit. But then you do a couple laps, and then you find the boundaries of the experience. And this is where that moment stays, and nothing about your relationship with the greater world changes. Exploration is largely a self-inspired action in games, so these journeys should feel complete when you feel you've seen everything and not when the game says so. When I explored Hoenn as a kid, even once I checked every pixel in the land, it still felt like an endless adventure. There's obviously a finite amount of content within the game, but by letting players recognize these markers for themselves, it allows for a stronger feeling of an open-ended adventure. 
And this is a very personal criticism. I have a certain way that I like to explore. If you disagree and you love these well-designed sections in Diamond Pearl, more power to you. I'm happy you can find joy in life where I cannot. Alright, that was a lot of tangential comparisons, L let's focus back on Emerald. By the time you reach Lily Cove, you're able to explore the vastness of the ocean. You have effectively explored all the walkable parts of the Hoenn region, all of which have been rich with diverse explorable areas. I've talked about some of the cool stuff like the abandoned ship, so I'm just going to go on a quick ramble about some of the notable ones before we get to the big ocean. The desert on Route 11 starts off as a natural barrier that you have to find your way around, but after receiving the goggles it becomes a shortcut and a new optional area to explore. There's a little secret cove just to the north of Rustboro and oh my god I haven't even talked about secret bases yet, I'll get to that in a sec. Stay on topic. Cool areas. Routes 119 and 120 don't have any iconic secrets, but they use the space really well, so it's a pretty tough area to get through with lots of diverging paths. Plus, you can do this. It's a bit cumbersome to do repeatedly, but if you really want to avoid wild encounters, that is well within your abilities. And again, it just feels good to have influence over the world, something they got rid of in later installments. The new Marvel side quest is exceptionally well placed. Gym Leader Watson is right in your path as you're making your way to Fortnite City. He asks you to visit an underground sector of the city and shut down a haywire generator. It's a good use of an NPC to bring the world to life through player action. Plus you get Thunderbolt out of this and that's awesome. The Safari Zone is neat and arguably the last good Safari Zone, but just to the south of it is Route 123, and that's an entire route that is purely optional. There is nothing required here, it exists solely to be explored. It's a bit out of the way, but the game has been teaching players since the beginning that exploring is good. I just really like the inconsequential side quests this game offers. It makes the world feel full. And as a cherry on top of all this exploration, we unlock some really satisfying shortcuts and useful shortcuts, just like Dark Souls. There's a couple more areas I want to get into, but let's talk about the water first. I really like the ocean in Emerald, and this is probably another weird opinion to have, which I totally get, because the ocean sucks in pretty much every other Pokemon game. You're constantly running a chance of encountering a wild Pokemon. It's like a cave, but wet. And if you don't like the ocean because long gauntlets aren't your cup of tea, I get it, and I think Game Freak does too, because there isn't as much required surfing in more recent games. But just hear me out. For one, the Hoenn Region Ocean isn't just a gauntlet of tentacle and trainer battles. There is so much room for activities in these oceans, and there's a wide variety of it too. Diving in between Lily Cove and Mozdeep is a seafaring treasure hunt. It's incredibly satisfying to systematically go through these dive spots and grab up everything you find. And up on the surface, you have Captain Shard sitting alone in his house offering to trade shards for evolutionary stones, which just makes them feel more valuable than finding them at the supermarket. I don't know. I, I like how it contextualizes the adventure just a little bit. Traveling down routes 126 and 27 inverts the diving experience because the secrets are on the surface, so if you really don't want to experience those gauntlets, just dive underneath, chill out to some music, and make your way down south. It's not the most explorable area, but it's a really cool way for the game to take a load off your shoulders and not have you deal with an onslaught of Pokemon, and also keep you in the world and not have you skip over the experience entirely. Alright, moving on to the water maze, the last major section of the ocean. Getting swept away by the strong currents while simultaneously trying to use them to navigate your way to the sealed cavern was a really satisfying experience. I didn't realize this as a kid because I had a lot of fun there, but it's a pretty barren section. There aren't many trainers and only like three items, but navigating this area is fun enough that the journey is the reward itself. Anyways, overcoming the strong currents is a jolly good time, but the real fun starts when you dive underwater. There's always a mystery of where you'll end up when you take a dive. But when you dive for the sealed cavern, you enter a cave, and you can immediately tell that something about this one is different. You work your way south, and eventually come across glowing markings on the wall, something else we haven't seen yet. Upon further inspection, it's braille that says, go up here. However, as a small, small child who definitely didn't learn anything about braille in the American education system, I had no clue what it was, said, huh, that's weird, and then just tried to resurface right there. And when you resurface on that specific tile, you enter the sealed chamber. And this setup is intentional. Compared to all of your adventuring, this area is pretty simple. The markings on the wall command your focus, so you interact there because, I don't know, what, what else do you do? And once you do resurface, the first thing you find is more braille on the walls. Looking back, it was a clear codec to translate the braille. But as an itty bitty baby with only two brain cells, I just couldn't put two and two together. I didn't have the answers, but one day I was flipping through a book and saw braille and the light bulb went off. Something about stumbling upon real world knowledge and applying it to video games is incredibly exciting. And if I had to pick a moment where I realized how much I loved video games, this is probably the one. Which is kind of weird to say because it's hard to argue this is good game design. The puzzle doesn't build off of the rest of the game. By comparison, the trick house is much more effective. 
combining your observational skills with HMs and other obstacles you've seen in the game. It, it just feels more natural. But for me at least, this moment in the sealed cavern is what made the Hoenn region feel truly alive. Since then, I've learned about all the other ways Game Freak integrates the real world into the games. And to be fair, it totally brings out more personality in the worlds they create. It's fun seeing how the lore of different Pokemon interact, and how they take inspiration from real world creatures and stories, and the regions themselves too, obviously. It might be a little weird, but I felt more connected to my grandparents when I realized that their hometown was pretty close to where Lily Cove City was. I don't think we're getting something as disjointed as having to recognize Braille in order to solve a puzzle in any future installments, but I appreciate that moment for what it was. Alright, more environments. And a break. Holy heck. I really love how they handled the dungeons in the Hoenn region. Caves and dungeons in general just kinda suck. Random encounters are a staple of JRPGs, but long slogs where you're constantly running the chance of having to fight a Zubat at any given time sucks. It's like a dry ocean. But in Gen 3, almost all of these gauntlets are optional. There are three major caves that are required. Duford Cave, Seafloor Cavern, and Victory Road. They aren't awful or even really that big. And Seafloor Cavern has some simple yet satisfying rock puzzles. However, outside of that, exploring caves is entirely optional. They exist to be spelunked at your convenience. Almost any other time the game forces you to enter a cave, you walk 10 feet in, have some plot, maybe a battle, and then you're out of there. Or it's a cave that gets you in and out like that. And aside from Victory Road, you're never required to wander through a large cave to get from point A to point B. And this just makes sense from a world building standpoint. Why does the infrastructure of the Pokemon region force people to travel through caves? A normal citizen of Pewter City should not have to travel through Mount Moon to go to Cerulean City. It, it just don't make no sense. I don't want to leave a cave thinking, Okay, cool, I'm done with that, now I can go have fun. The cave itself should be fun. Meteorite Falls, Mount Pyre, and Shoal Cave are all these massive dungeons that you take on as a challenge to yourself. And if you so choose to take on these challenges, you can find some neat items and exclusive Pokemon you can't catch anywhere else. Being an explorer in the Hoenn region is great because it has that strong feeling of the journey is the reward. From the beginning, you've got this exhilarating running start, you unlock abilities that allow you to sate your hunger for adventure, not because it's required, but because you want to. And from there, the game is throwing opportunity after opportunity to explore. It gets me so excited and I want to just keep on seeing the sights and I hate the fact that the momentum dies in Gen 4. I'm sorry, the hate on Gen 4 alarm went off again, I have no control over these situations. If it isn't clear yet, I really like Gen 3, and it bums me out that so much of what I loved about that game was taken out of the Sinnoh region. All these little tweaks to the movement, to how the HMs are used, to the ding dang mud. What are you doing Game Freak? Getting stuck in the mud and snow kills exploration. Adventure is a forward momentum. Random encounters are tedious, sure, but at least you get something out of them. Getting stuck in the mud has no redeemable value, and it's just there to make you say no! It just exists to make you feel sad. <sighs> Okay, before we wrap things up, let's hit one last section. Secret bases. Ugh, alright, fine. But after this, no more hating on Diamond Pearl. Probably. The underground in Gen 4 is legitimately pretty fun. I like the traps and the mining, but it's, it's detached from the Sinnoh region itself. Like, literally. It kinda matters where you are in the overworld, but by and large, it doesn't really change much once you get down there. And when you load in with a friend, the base is temporary because it works off a local wireless, so there's no sense of communal permanence. I think it's so cool that once you link up with a friend in Gen 3, you can find their secret base in your game at any time. Again, it's another tangible connection to the real world. And even if you don't have that opportunity, walking by your base as you explore the overworld has the sense of ownership that you just don't get in the underground or the campsites. And I like that depending on where you make your base, the environment can vary, not just in like layout, but in textures just giving it that extra bit of customizability. And when you enter secret bases, the music changes, and that's just a nice touch to really solidify that it's a secret spot. It's another really nice thing that they again got rid of in Gen 4. Now, to be perfectly fair, the secret bases in Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire are the perfect version of this. The 3DS Street Pass makes it so much more accessible, and, and to a lesser extent, the DS Local Wireless did the same thing. I love to rag on Gen 4, but credit where credit's due. But I think that wraps everything up. If you've made it this far, thanks for sticking around while I go on an obsessive tirade about a game that I love dearly. Like I said at the beginning, this game is where my passion for games ignited. There's a bunch of nitty gritty details that I could probably attack you with for hours, but I think we've gone over the big elements that define this game for me. I might make more reasonably sized videos about those other parts in Emerald, because you know, normally I make my videos much more to the point about a smaller concept, but I just felt that this one deserved a little more. Thanks again, and I'll see you all next time. I really hate the mud. Oh.
Oh boy. Okay. I'm done. I'm tired. Um, yeah, that, that's about it. Um, I think I did a good job explaining why I like this game a lot. Maybe. I don't know. I, I don't want to do another video this long again. It's kind of tiring. Um, but hope you're having a good day. Uh, if you're watching this, um, thanks for making it this far because, you know, you didn't have to. So I appreciate that. Cool. I'm going to go sleep now. Bye-bye.